time. So if you will stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I don't think Kate Stewart needs a lot of introduction. She's done this for us several times, and we really, really appreciate it that you come in September. This is our literacy. Uh, literary month that we emphasize William Faulkner and she's going to review a book today she's one of our own uh, if you don't know her you can talk to her later she's a professor at the University of Arkansas at Monticello she has a book in the works um, the pictures from parchment that you may have seen at the museum so she can tell you about that if she has time but just welcome you Dr. Stewart I always appreciate the kind welcome that I get here and that some people have flattered my ego by saying, oh, I just wouldn't have missed this. <laughs> and all I can think about is a section of William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury when uh, the, local, uh, the local church, uh, the local church in town, the African-American church is going to have a high-powered revivalist in by the name of Reverend Shegog. And so they gathered at church and uh, Reverend Shegog was up on the pulpit and Frony looked at him and he was all dried up and wizened and just a little bitty thing. And her comment on that was to herself because she knew how to behave in public was you mean they done brought that all the way down from St. Louis? <laughs> and so that's, a, you know, you hope that doesn't turn out like this. That's a, that is one of my favorite lines in fault. You mean they done brought that all the way down from St. Louis? I didn't come in from St. Louis. Exactly. And I think about when I, uh, when Linda told me what we would be reading, I said, okay, you got some homework to do. And I think probably when I start reading something new like this, I think of it through a sieve of, I wonder how that would teach in class. Well, this is the first novel Faulkner ever wrote. And it hasn't gotten a lot of attention necessarily. But the more I read this, I said, okay, Literature of the South class next semester, we will be reading Soldier's Pay. Now, I'm also going to make them read Absalom, Absalom, but that's okay. They can endure that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that experience with them in going through this novel. I think it was, uh, it's fascinating to me that you have people who would say, we're going to recognize the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I by looking at this novel because that's exactly what it is. And when I got on Amazon, which is where I like to find good deals on books, I looked at the various covers on Soldier's Pay, and if you know anything about the uh, some of the options that uh, entrance into the artist, into the contest, the art contest, could pursue. They had several covers of soldiers pay on there. Well, when I saw the one on Amazon with the cover with the World War I helmet on it, I said, that's the one I want. I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, <laughs> but what I should have done to really make this an interesting talk would be to have gone upstairs yesterday at the house and brought the World War I helmet that is in my house. I could have also brought some knapsacks. But unfortunately, there were two Stewart children who 
played with the gas mask that we had to the extent that we left it out in the yard. So it's no longer with us. Now, what I'm faulting those Stewart children's parents for is that they did not see to getting the gas mask back in the house to preserve it because no telling what we could have gotten on Antique Roadshow for us. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I will, now I was not around for this. Goodness knows I played with that helmet enough, but some of you know my cousin, Catherine Warrington King. And uh, be sure to tell Catherine <laughs> that she's been mentioned in this. What, and this was this generation of cousins, first cousins to step up. One of them knocked Catherine out with that helmet. So, you know, she survived it. Now, I'm interested in this between the war period. Now, for my purposes, I'm going to talk about two specific instances of recordings of what it was like in the aftermath of war. The first one, the first passage I want to share with you is a William Dean Howells short story called Editha from 1905. And the young woman in there, have you heard of that? You, have you heard of Editha by William Dean Howells? Yeah. Would that my students remembered it. Uh, <laughs> I enjoy teaching this young woman engaged pressures her fiance into going to the Spanish-American War because of the glory of war and all that, he gets killed. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. It's seeing the character development in there that's a lot of fun. But she goes to see her mother-in-law, and here she's in the widow's garb and the whole business. and. This is what, the, I'm going to read the encounter that she had with her mother-in-law. I would rather have died myself than done it, and this is what Editha says, with more truth in her deep voice than she ordinarily found in it. I tried to leave him free. Yes, that letter of yours that came back with his other things left him free. Editha saw now where George's irony came from. It was not to be read before unless until I told him so, she faltered. Of course, he wouldn't read a letter of yours under the circumstances till he thought you wanted him to, been sick? The woman abruptly demanded. Very sick, Editha said with self-pity. Daughter's life, her father interposed, was almost despaired of at time. Mrs. Gerson gave him no heed. I suppose you would have been glad to die such a brave person as you. I don't believe he was glad to die. He was always a timid boy. That way, he was afraid of a good many things, but he was afraid he did what he made up his mind to. I suppose he made up his mind to go, but I know what it cost him by what it cost him when I heard of it. I had been through one war before. When you sent him, you didn't expect he would be killed. It gets even a little worse before we finish that up. Another account of what happened in the aftermath of war, and I apologize for following William Dean Howells. I don't think he would appreciate my doing this. With an episode from NCIS. 
you had uh, a soldier from the Vietnam War who was on one of these trips to D.C. to visit and see the sights, and he happens to be in close proximity to a murder. And uh, let's just say that Vietnam veteran is not exactly a laugh a minute. He is quite embittered by the experience that he had. And as the scene unfolds, yes, they solved the crime, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also that human element that you get into that you get to the source of his bitterness. And that was when he came back from the war in Vietnam, he didn't have a group of people at the airport welcoming him. He had people who spit on him, jeered at him. So there you have those two episodes of what happened at the end of those wars. Uh, I think we get a rather different picture at the end of World War II that there's more jubilation there. But in the aftermath of World War I, which is our focus, you had people in that aftermath who were disillusioned, questioned what they had ultimately done at the number of lives lost in that war, of asking what's the point of it. And then you had those writers in the 1920s whom Gertrude Stein labeled the lost generation. And Faulkner would have been in that crowd, as was Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and some others. And I want to read a review of Soldier's Pay. It's the first review of Soldier's Pay that appeared came out in April of 1926 when the novel had been published. This was before the New York, New York Times got it in April. This is from March of 1926, and it was in the Atlanta Journal by a writer for the Constitution, well, it's not the con wasn't the Constitution then, it was just the journal, by the name of Peggy Mitchell. That would have been Margaret Mitchell wrote the first review of Faulkner's first novel. And this is, <laughs> the internet's a wonderful thing, except I got this off of the MLA database. And this is what, uh, she didn't get the title right. You know, people always have trouble with that apostrophe S. She put her apostrophe in the wrong place. <laughs> she did. Since 1918, this is what Margaret Mitchell wrote. Since 1918, thousands of stories have been written of the return of the soldier and the bitterness and disillusion that chanced conditions produced in him. Soldiers Pay by William Faulkner strikes an entirely new note in post-war fiction, but it tells of a different sort of homecoming, a homecoming that will be, that he, that will he especially, that will be especially interesting to Southerners. As the scene is laid in Charleston, a small town 20 miles or so from Atlanta. No, Yuck and Patalfa County had not been created at this point. Donald Mahan came home to Charleston and did not even know he was coming home for, and this is a quotation, in his mind, time and space had stood still since a machine gun bullet from a German plane had scarred his face and battered his skull. On the southbound train, Donald's dazed and fumbling movements and his terribly scarred face attracted the pity of two fellow passengers, John Gilligan, 
recently demobilized enlisted man and Mrs. Margaret Powers, a young war widow. This, well, and um, Faulkner says of that young woman that Aubrey Beardsley would have loved to have painted her. His homecoming is a bombshell in the small Georgia town for he has been mourned as dead by his father, Cecily, his shallow witted fiance, and Emmy, a country girl whose lover he once was. Thank you, Margaret Mitchell, for that interview or that review. Now, before World War One, I've heard a number of historians and cultural pundits say, uh, among them R.C. Sproul, a Reformed theologian, said that the world changed in 1914. Uh, Sproul even comments that, and this was before 9-11, so I didn't see any updates on this. Someone once asked him what the most significant development and maybe it's qualified in the 20th century was. And he said, when it was, and he said 1914. Now, I think from the Americans' perspective, we don't look at that with quite the same eyes as they do in Europe when the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo in 1914. But you see a change in the way people approached life at that point. I always talk to my students about this, that uh, if they had asked me, there's a part of me that would be more comfortable starting the modern period in literature in 1914 instead of the turn of the century, because I think you see more dramatic changes in the whole psyche of the world after 1914, and a lot of historians will mark 1914 as the beginning of modern history. But then, what I love about being in English, you don't have to worry about dates as much as we do. Uh, you, well, you can speculate and say, well, if you get it within 10 years, that's all right. Historian can't look at it that way. Now, interestingly, you have both F. Scott Fitzgerald and William Faulkner, who wanted desperately to participate in the war when it came. They just really, and Faulkner tried to join the military, but they wouldn't take him in the United States because he was too short. So he went to Canada and joined the RAF and well, I think his health was an issue, too. Fitzgerald never saw combat, nor did Faulkner ever see combat. Now, on the other hand, Ernest Hemingway drove an ambulance during the war. And I will add as a side note, since we always like to mention Paul Rainey around here, he also drove an ambulance during World War I. Now, he bought his own vehicle. If, if my memory is serving me correctly, it was a Packard. Now, why that's, you know, our minds get in all kinds of junk like that. Uh, one of these days, and I doubt that one of these days will ever come, uh, I have toyed with the idea of exploring this relationship in ambulance driving between Hemingway and Paul Rainey. I don't, I'm not suggesting that they ever met. Uh, they were both Miss Westerners, though, now that I think about it. Both Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald literally were crushed that they did not get to participate actively in the war. Now, to me, there's a big difference in doing your duty as a citizen 
participating in the war and just doing it because you have something of this same idea that Editha had that it was a glorious experience. Uh, when her fiance George tells her that they've declared war, Spanish-American War, her response to that is how glorious. <coughs> and little wonder then that her mother-in-law is going to say, you didn't expect him to get killed, did you? She also was about ready to snatch her widow's garb off of her. When she came in there all bedecked, and of course, Editha explained that away by saying, well, I think she was had lost her mind. But I think there's a real paradox as I thought about this. And I can see traces of this in soldiers' pay. I think there's a real paradox between what is obviously, and I think Margaret Mitchell gives us a good commentary on here about the reaction of this disillusionment that people had when they came back. I think she, you know, she was close to the situation. You've got to assume that she knew people, soldiers. She may have interviewed them for the, the paper, uh, for all we know. But there's a real paradox to me with this idea of the disillusionment and the lost generation that these people had with this theme of sadness that we see in both Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald that they didn't see battle. And, you know, I hadn't totally figured that out in my mind, but now to get to the novel at hand. Uh, and I tell Bill Everett, if you decide to sit down and read Soldier's Pay, don't expect a Hallmark movie. I don't <laughs> believe Hallmark is gonna touch this. Kiss no, no. <laughs> it, now, <laughs> no, no. It is, a, and I want to tell you, I can't wait. I, I'll just be honest with you. Can't wait to see how my students are going to react to this. <laughs> I, I really and truly can't. Of course, this is the same person who last spring a year ago, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with Sandra Brown, a novelist. She started out writing like those Harlequin romances or something. And somebody suggested, I mean, it was a professor of English suggested that to me. And my students with that were just stunned that I had assigned that to them. Just stunned. When I, the first day they came in and said, I can't believe you assigned this. And I said, I thought you'd lap it up the way you go into that trash fiction that they're, <laughs> you're reading now. We had. And I thought the ultimate insult was when one of the students said, this is something like my mother would read. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought <coughs> half of those students are teaching English in Southeast Arkansas, teaching English and French in Southeast Arkansas. They're absolutely splendid students. <laughs> These are the ones you'd be happy for your children to have in their classes. Uh, but I can't wait. It, this novel is, well, I guess you'd have to say in a certain way that all of Faulkner can be a little sleazy at times. This one does not disappoint in that category. It's not, don't expect explicit, but if you want, and I'll, I'll suggest two biographies to you of Faulkner if you'd like to dabble in them. I think you can get a shortened version of Joseph Blotner's biography. His is a, originally a two-volume set. And he approaches Faulkner's work more from the cultural aspects. Frederick Carl, who, by the way, did a little introduction for this uh, rendering of the novel that I ordered, does more of a life and works approach. He considers more biographical. Now, for my purposes, when I teach literature, I'm less interested for good or ill in the 
author's biography than I am in the themes and ideas and those sorts of things. But Frederick Carl says that he looks at soldiers' pay through a biographical sieve, selecting three of the main of the male characters in here and talking about how they become these aren't this is not Carl's words. I hope I'm not misquoting his intent here, that they are fall, are fall alter egos for Faulkner. The first one is Julian Lowe, who happened to be on that train ride. Uh, and what happened on this train trip is that Joe Gilligan and Margaret Powers escort Donald Mayon on to Georgia. They part ways, I think it's in Chicago if I'm remembering correctly, and Julian goes on to California, and then they go, those other two go to Georgia with Donald. Uh, quite honestly, given his condition at the end of the war, he would have needed somebody because it's the absolute truth that he had no idea that he was on the way home. And with the type of head injury that he had, you can well imagine that. One of the covers of the novel had this, and he had this prominent scar across his forehead where he had been injured. You don't have a whole lot about it except here's this, and he's going blind, and I mean, his condition is just tragic. But, uh, he, everybody knows he's dying, they know he's going blind, and this is at the beginning of the novel. Isn't that a wonderful way to start a novel? Uh, <laughs> that's not a Hallmark movie. Well, yeah, that could be. Julian Lowe is a character who, in many ways, like Faulkner, and I'm not saying that Carl is off base here, Julian Lowe says, uh, he says of Julian Lowe that this is the character who aspired to be a hero. And when he wasn't really a hero, what do you do? You create the persona of being one. And I've, I've, Carl also said in another context that this was one thing that Faulkner tried to do, and it's not that the Faulkners and that whole group were not what you'd call upper middle class, merchant class people, but they weren't the aristocracy either. But Faulkner aspired to that, and therefore there was a certain thing in Faulkner that he tried to create something that he was not, that he, I don't know if you'd call him a social climber or not. Then you have Donald Mahon, the wounded warrior, and said that that's the way Faulkner viewed himself. Well, he couldn't get into the military through the ordinary route because of not physical disabilities but disqualifications for his physical appearance, and he had also had... Uh, some hard luck with women that it got rejected by a number of women. Now there's a kind of an undercurrent of that in here. And then finally you have as another alter ego, you have Joe Gilligan who is the more self-aware character uh, because he can sum things up and say, we all got horrible memories of the war, which is probably pretty realistic. And then we have Let's pair up three women to go with these men. You've got Margaret Powers, the young war widow, who is on the train. And for lack of a better word, she is rather smitten with Donald. I think that's a good old fashioned term to use. You have Donald's fiance, Cecily Saunders who has apparently been unfaithful. Well, I, well, let me back up a minute. 
I don't think it's apparently unfaithful <laughs> to Donald. Well, he, I don't, uh-uh, I can't say that. I think if you really read the text, we can't dress that up. She was unfaithful to him. <laughs> so here she is, really doesn't want to marry him anymore. And when she first sees Donald in the condition that he's in, she sees that scar and she faints and has to take to her bed for several days. And then her little brother, probably about a 12 year old little brother, the first question he asked her, I'm sorry, but this Faulkner is funny. His first question is, did you see his scar? <laughs> you know? I don't know whether that is the response of a 10, 12 year old to do something like that, or there's something really Southern about that. I, well, never mind, I have heard people, and then you have Emmy, the household servant, cook, maid, whatever, who was Donald's former lover. Now, you can't undress that one either, particularly. Cecily starts wanting, now you talk about an interesting love triangle with these. Now, we have other, the two other men involved in some of this that we can go to, but, you know, I envision this as kind of a lunchtime activity and people have things to do at one o'clock and beyond, so I try to get through <coughs> before that. This works really well with my time frame because on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, I'm accustomed to teaching 50-minute classes so this works really well. I know exactly how many lecture, how many pages of lecture notes I need uh, to do this. But Emmy is still very much attached to Donald. Now I think there's a real suggestion in here that this is nothing more than a sexual encounter with Donald in his. Well, Emmy is from the wrong side of the track, so to speak, and. Uh, I haven't had time to speculate and prowl the novel as much as I want to to make this assertion, but this may be something fun to do with the students next semester. And that is, since the rector, and that's uh, Donald's father is a minister in Episcopal Church, since he, she is in that household working there was this speculation on my part, did the father actually know of their personal relationship? Now, I haven't had time to explore that as deeply as I would like, and I'm not going to go any further than that until I explore the text a little more. That's what I encourage my students to do. You gotta read the thing before you can make an, an assessment here. But Emmy is the one who's willing and this involves feeding Donald his meals and tending to, well, Joe Gilligan largely took care of his everyday personal needs, but in terms of providing the food and seeing to him in that way, Emmy was the one who would still probably have married Donald. Well, you enter into this and for whatever reason, Margaret Powers, decides she wants to marry Donald. Now, you, I mean, now seriously, you talk about an interesting, I'm not even sure we can talk triangle here. Uh, I think if we started drawing this, somebody, one, one of the math teachers in here, Jamie Grace, will have to remind me if you call that thing a rhombus. <laughs> you know, cause isn't that the one that doesn't have the, even sides that it's, it's that four-sided figure that's warped. <laughs> uh, even five. Well, I can't, you know, I can't remember, but well, it's been a while since I've had math. <laughs> I, and it's surprising how much algebra I do remember. 
But then I did have Mary V. Golding. <laughs> Some of the rest of us have been there. But here you have Cecily wanting to marry somebody else, but she really gets more, and she won't even go see Donald. But she doesn't want Margaret to have him either. And so this is when she gets all hot and bothered about, okay, I'm gonna marry him no matter what. And her parents don't want her to marry. She doesn't really want to. And it's really a sad, it's really a sad situation. I'm, I sound, and that's part of the nature of my character, I sound like I'm making light of this. It's re this is really, in some ways, maybe one of the more tragic stories of Faulkner's I've dealt with. Uh, Absalom, Absalom is not a laugh a minute, and neither is Light in August. Neither one of those are funny novels, but they don't seem as deeply tragic in terms of the human element in here that you can look at some of the, and I think about the Compsons in The Sound and The Fury, and of course they filter through those. Uh, yes, you have to look at some tragedy in their lives, but some of that is of their own doing when they can't give up the fact that their aristocratic life is no longer a real life anymore, that it's an illusion. And I think that's one of the problems with Donald's father, is that he can't accept the reality that his son's dying. And he doesn't appear to be a stupid man by any stretch. He's just in a cocoon of sorts. Uh, two very interesting little side notes that occur to me right now uh, to bring up. And these aren't elements in this novel that necessarily have a whole lot to do with the development of the novel and the characters. If I had to say to you, what do you consider the most important element of this novel that we ought to look at, I would say the interplay of these six characters that I mentioned. And putting in the other two is kind of these <coughs> side elements, but I put in those, those three. One of them has to do with the fact, now this is, 1919 is when this is set. And this would have not been something you would have readily seen. But Margaret Powers, now don't laugh too much, but I think it's significant, smokes. Not only smokes, period, but she smokes in public. And at one point in the novel, uh, Reverend Mahan is trying to light his pipe and he can't, he's in a state so that he's having trouble and Margaret gives him a cigarette and says, here, try this. Now, I just thought that was a really odd sort of scene to have in there because this is the time, it's usually the 1920s that culture tells us that women started smoking like smokestacks. Now, that's not true because if you read any of Edith Wharton's works. If you read uh, uh, The House of Mirth, which is one of my favorites, I'm supposed to have everybody look at The Age of Innocence, which is a fine novel, but The, the House of Mirth is my favorite. Well, in that society world, you have women smoking quite a bit, but not so much in public. The other thing is, and Donald's father does play a significant role in this novel because it is largely set in his house, in the rectory. Uh, but yet, I have to honestly say, religion and Christianity play 
a quite insignificant role in this novel. Even to have a minister. Now, uh, if you read Light in August, Gail Hightower had his problems as a minister. He was a miserable failure as a minister. But there's quite a bit of attention to his failure as a spiritual leader and why he failed in that novel. Uh, as a shepherd of the flock and the shepherd of his own family and the community, the minister in here is a pretty dismal failure. In a, and I don't know if it's just, if you could account for it in the trauma that he, and stress that he's under because of his son, this unrealistic sort of approach. But from what, as I read the novel, from the early going of this novel, everybody knew that Donald was dying. Everybody knew that he was going to die. Uh, I'm not going to read the death scene entirely, but I always like to with Faulkner because he's so rich in the way he writes things. I always like to share some purple passages, as I like to call them. Now, this is on the train, and it gives that sense of I thought about this is what made me think of the NCIS episode and how veterans are treated sometimes when they come back from war, and this is on the train. He don't want us here. Now, these are the soldiers talking about the conductor on the train. And this is the reward we get for giving our flesh and blood to our country's need. Yes, sir, he don't want us here. He begrudges us riding on his train, even. Say, suppose we hadn't sprung to the nation's call. Do you know what kind of train you'd have? A train full of Germans. A train full of folks eating sausage and drinking beer, all going to Milwaukee. That's what you'd have. <laughs> now see, Faulkner will do this to you every time. You are just, that's a painful thing. And they say, this is what you'd have. You're going to go to Milwaukee, sausage and beer. That's it. Now, this is later in the novel. Uh, and you have some exchange here, Cecily, the whole business. Oh, George, uh, this, is, this is Cecily talking to her former lover, current lover, ever how you want to look at it. It all happened so suddenly, I don't know what to think. When we were in there talking about him, it all seemed so grand for Donald to be coming back in spite of that woman with him. There's Margaret Powers. And to be engaged to a man who will be famous when he gets here Oh, it seemed then that I did love him. It was exactly the thing to do. Now, I realize, despite my declarations, that I'm on an, an expert in both marriage and child rearing <laughs> because I've done neither. It strikes me that you don't marry because it's exactly the thing to do. See, y'all could write so many good papers on this. Now, here's a nice, good Faulkner passage. You know, I'll, I'll pull these out. The divine became aware of the absence of Cecily, who was at this moment, now this is Donald, who was at this moment sitting in a stationary motor car in an obscure lane, crying on the shoulder of a man whose name was not Donald. Jones, and this is the, uh, and this is the only, uh, this is another one of the men in here. Jones, the only one who had remarked the manner of her going was for some reason he could not before have named safely noncommittal. 
the rector stated fretfully that Cecily, who was at that moment <coughs> kissing a man, I love that the way Faulkner plays off, you've got this scene and that scene, a movie maker could have, and this was before Faulkner even started working in the movie, so he wouldn't have gained that sense. I think it was just in eight. Kissing a man whose name was not Donald should have gone away at that time, but the other woman, I bet she means as hell. I bet she's as mean as hell. <laughs> thought Jones interrupted again saying it was better. There's one scene in here, there are actually two places in here where Faulkner plays off the voices of the townspeople and some of the characters talking, carrying on these simultaneous thoughts. I thought Faulkner did a nice job there. And then I finally, I want to conclude with this one. Donald Mahon lay quietly conscious. By the way, Donald and Margaret did get married. And Cecily married George, the one she was out in the car with. <laughs> I hate to give away that much, but it really doesn't. Donald lay quietly conscious of unseen, forgotten spring, of greenness neither recalled nor forgot. After a time, the nothingness in which he had lived took him wholly again, but restlessly. It was like a sea into which he could neither completely pass nor completely go away from. Day became afternoon, became dusk, an imminent evening, evening like a ship with twilight colored sails dreamed down the world darkly toward darkness, and suddenly he found that he was passing from the dark world in which he had lived for a time but could not remember again into a day that had long passed, that had already been spent by those who lived and wept and died. And so, remembering it, this day was his alone was one trophy he had reft from time and space. This is Faulkner's first novel, and he's, in 1926, he's able to write like this. The, uh, uh, let me add one thing. I am not a Faulkner scholar. Uh, I'm a, I do a variety of research my current project, other than the little parchment book that I'm editing, my current project is on Perry Mason. Uh, next month at Friends of the Library, we have Dr. Jennifer Ford, who is from the University of Mississippi Special yeah, Collections, and she will be here. I think that will be very interesting. We have a book sale here at the library the day uh, the River Fest on September 29th, all day to support the library. So please come and support our local library. We're getting a lot more support now, and that's good. Well, thank you very much for coming and enjoy the rest of the festivities this month. Yeah.